Conversation would ensue. Uh, where away? Give me a basic compass direction. What kind? How many? Uh, in the American whale fishery, what kind was really important? Because they only really hunted three types of whales the bowhead whale, the right whale, and the sperm whale. Uh, because, for one, those whales are slow enough to catch up to, but more importantly, those species of whales tend to float after they were dead, which is really important when you uh, attach you know, a 40 ton whale to a one ton boat. You can't have it pulling you down to the bottom. So, uh, uh, how many was also important. The Charles W. Morgan had the ability to lower five boats at once. So if they saw a whole pot of whales, they could lower all of their boats. Uh, if they only saw one whale, they might still lower two boats, for reasons we'll get into in a minute. Uh, lastly, uh, how far off? Can we sail the ship up to it, or do we need to launch immediately? Uh, once all that information is given, the uh, decision was made as to which boat to lower. Uh, in this case, the starboard bow boat was lowered. And you saw two men get to go down in the boat. The man uh, in my position up here, known as uh, today as the harpooner, uh, more often known as a boat steerer, uh, and the man in Emily's position, who is the boat header, the officer in charge of the boat. Uh, those two men get to row down in the boat. Everybody else has to slide down the ropes, uh, climb down the sides of the ship, whatever it is. Uh, once the boat hits the water, uh, and every man is inside, some organized chaos and confusion happens as all these oars need to be crossed, the harpoons put in position, the harpoons tied, ready to go, and then finally, they can row up to the whale. Now, the man in this position is actually rowing with his back facing the target, just like everybody else, uh, but he's listening for a command that sounds like, Stand up and give it to him! At which point, they've gotten right up to the whale, literally beached themselves on the back of it. They call it white cedar to black skin. He's going to pull his oar across the boat, uh, place his thigh in a, this cutout area up here called the clumsy cleat, and he's going to take up an iron and prepare to dart this down into the back of the whale. The reason they want to be right on the whale is this cannot be thrown. It's not well balanced. It's got a long wooden shaft here. It's designed to be thrust down. Uh, we actually have uh, two um, irons in the boat here, uh, two different styles, uh, which was often very common. Um, but uh, the reason that we have these harpoons, the harpoon is designed not to kill a whale, but actually to go in and stay in. It's designed like a fish hook. Um, and so uh, once the first harpoon is darted in, they would take up the second, try to get that one in as well. If not, they would take the second harpoon and throw it out of the boat because both of these harpoons are tied to the same line. That line runs through this chalk in the bow, underneath a strap here called the kicking strap that keeps it out of the face of the men involved. It then goes over the top of all the oars to that friction point all the way in the back called the loggerhead, and then down into those two tubs of line. So once the first harpoon is in the whale, uh, that uh, this boat is attached to that whale and it becomes a very dangerous situation. Now, to ensure that these harpoons stayed in, we actually have two different styles, a more uh, an older style and a more modern style. Uh, this is the more recognizable, it's known as a double flued iron. Um, the problem was it was a big sharp head and it tended to create a big wound, which made it easy to pull back out of unless the weapon was able to get a twist or something like that. Uh, so in 1848, a shipsmith out of New Bedford 
uh, by the name of Lewis Temple, perfected a style. Uh, he actually got the idea from the Inuit Indians. Uh, they made theirs out of bone and wood. He made his out of high temper steel. Um, but this was known as a toggling iron. So as you can see, it has a low profile head. There'd be a matchstick placed in this hole here. And once the whale was darted and the uh, harpooner pulled back on it, it would toggle the head open and change the shape. It's dull on the back, so it tended to lock it in. It's actually double the amount of whales that they caught. Now, all of our research here at Mystic Seaport has indicated that whales don't like to be harpooned. Uh, and so the whale's gonna react in some way. If you've seen a lot of maritime art, the whale immediately smashes the boat to pieces, which did happen, but not nearly as often as, as it was portrayed. Uh, more often, the whale would do one of two things. It might dive or sound for the bottom, which becomes a problem because remember, this harpoon is tied to this boat. Uh, and between those two tubs, we have about 1,800 feet of line, and an adult squirrel can dive about a half mile straight down. So there's a big difference there. So uh, they have a couple options. One, they could tie on a, what was called a drogue or a drag, basically a big float to try and make it tougher for the whale to pull down. They essentially like the big yellow barrels and, and, uh, and jaws. Uh, they also might call over a second boat uh, and tie their line on to double the amount of line they've got. Um, or worst case scenario, this boat is starting to become a submarine uh, and they need to deal with the problem. They would take out what we like to refer to as a crisis management tool uh, <laughs> and cut that line to let that whale go. The problem is, if you do this, not only are you losing the whale, but you're also losing all the rope it pulled out and the harpoons you drove into it. So it's a very expensive option to try and cut that whale loose. Most likely what a whale is going to do, luckily for the whale that involved, is the whale wants to stay on the surface where it can breathe. It came up from a long dive, it takes a long time to refill its lungs, so it's gonna stay right on the surface, um, but it's not gonna hang out here and figure out what's going on. The whale would take off, uh, running in bursts of speed of up to 20 miles per hour, uh, whalemen refer to this as the Nantucket Sleigh Ride, uh, in later days the Simp, or uh, often uh, sometimes referred to as the Sleigh Ride simply. Um, but while that's going on, there's a lot of other things going on in the boat, so make sure the rest of the crew can tell you about those different jobs. The man in my position was called the bow oarsman or the preventer boat steerer. Preventer, because if something happens to this man, like he fell overboard, this man would have to harpoon the whale, and he would get an immediate raise. Who's continuously rowing? Um, and you can see that there are three ways to power this boat. You saw one of them already. This one, which is the paddles, uh, quiet but not very speedy. This is a mast hinge or a tabernacle. You can step a mast into this and actually sail this boat, um, which is also quiet. Uh, but the fastest way to move this boat is with the oars. Unfortunately, whales are very, for the whalemen, the whales are very smart and the, the oars were noisy. So if you came up on, thank you. So if you came up on whales who had been hunted before, they might remember that sound and think of it as dangerous. This person is, is also the person um, that, the, or the position that was rowed uh, by Ishmael in Moby Dick, if you are a Melville fan, and also by Melville when he went whaling. So the man in this position was the midship's oarsman. And uh, you can see how the boat is pointed at both ends. So this is the lightest part. Consequently, the longest and heaviest oar. This oar can be up to 18 feet long and weigh up to 45 pounds. So generally, the man in this position was the biggest and strongest of all the men. And you can see we're following tradition today. <laughs> <laughs> a water breaker in which there were three to five gallons of fresh water, an upper day in the tropics or a couple of days out of the tropics, and back then was a lantern keg in which there was a lantern and uh, some means of lighting it, such as loose for matches or flinted steel, and also some, some um, food for the men, such as hardtack, uh, double baked biscuits, or, uh, or um, a dried meat, or even maybe something like tight tobacco. <laughs> The man in this position is known as the tub oarsman, not because he had any particular propensity for taking a bubble bath, but because he is in between these two big tubs of whale line. Uh, the, uh, again, they had about 1,800 to 2,000 feet of line in this boat, and once that whale is harpooned, this line is going to begin paying out very quickly, coming both under and over this man's oar, making it one of the, the more dangerous positions 
of all the dangerous positions in this boat. Uh, so he had uh, a tool at his disposal to give himself just a modicum more safety. This is called a double rollick oarlock. Uh, once the whale was harpooned, he would lift his oar from this lower rollock to the upper rollock, giving himself a few extra inches of space, of clearance for that line to pay out, so it wouldn't tangle around his oar and go out, taking out the two men behind him, one of whom was an officer, which meant that it was considered bad form. Um, uh, also near this man was a uh, small one-handled bucket called a piggin. Uh, this line is made of a natural fiber, and particularly as it seen around the uh, longer end there at the back, um, uh, it could get very, very hot uh, from all the friction. And in a worst case scenario, it could begin to fray and then part, and if it parts, then you've lost your whale. So the man in this position would take water from either inside or outside the boat, pour it onto these two tubs of line, as well as onto the loggerhead itself to keep it nice and cool. The man in this position is known as the aft horseman. He gets that name because he's seated in the aft end of this boat. In modern crew terms, he might be known as the stroke horseman because he's the one who's responsible for keeping the pace that everyone in the boat is going to be growing at. That's because everyone else can either see the blade of his oar or his shoulders and match the pace as he's growing. Now, he's not the one responsible for actually setting the pace. That would be done by the officer with maybe a hand on his oar for some kind words about his dubious sanitary habits. Now, uh, during the whale hunt, this man would also have an additional job. The, the uh, whale would be taking off in nice bursts of speed, but then he'd start to slow down uh, to reoxygenate its blood. And what the men would do is they'd turn around and actually pull in on this whale line, and the after oarsman would have the responsibility of coiling it neatly on this area here called the stern sheets, so that when the whale started to take off again, that line would pay out cleanly and not take off. Now, at this point, you've heard several references start 
swimming in smaller and smaller circles until it rolls fin out, and then you know you either have a dead or an unconscious whale. And it's very important to make that distinction before you tie it to your boat. So as such, they would poke it in a sensitive area like the eye or the lip and see if it had a reaction. If it did, you went through the whole process again. If it didn't, then you have some key uh, decisions to make. Now whales have a family that is called pods, and so it's possible you could have lowered for multiple whales. Now if you can get more than one whale in one lowering, then all the better for you, less time you have to be out, all sorts of things. Now the problem becomes, even though these three types of whales float when they die, they float below the surface of the water. So as soon as you get more than about a yard away from them, you'll never reliably find it again. So whalemen invented this high-tech GPS tracking device <laughs> called a weight. It's exactly as it looks, it's a flag on a stick. It would hang above, or not hang, but it would stick above the water line so that you could find that whale again. It would have the initials of the main vessel, such as CWM for Charles W. Morgan, uh, or possibly even SBB for starboard bow boat, so you know which whale boat uh, that they lowered actually killed that whale. Now this is a legal marking device. There are court cases fought over whalers stealing others' waif whales, uh, but it didn't happen often because it was illegal. Now, if there's no other whales in the area, or if your boat is damaged, or if your crew is injured, then you have to begin the arduous process of towing that whale back. To give you some perspective, a good fit whale boat crew can get this boat going without anything attached to it, about five, six miles an hour. When you attach a whale, however, that drops drastically to about a half mile, mile an hour. So if you've been towed five to 10 miles away from the, the main vessel, uh, you could have 10 to 20 hours of rowing just to get it back. And then once you get there, you're not done yet because you immediately have to begin processing that whale. So you're gonna make the towing a little bit easier uh, by taking out a boat spade, which is just a broad, flat knife, to trim off anything that's gonna create drag, like the flukes uh, or the fins, you know, parts of the tail. You'll make a hole in the lip or the tail of the whale, and you'll pass a toggle back up uh, through that hole to tow it back. And then once you get it back, you immediately begin processing it. Because the longer that that whale starts to decay, the more rancid that layer of blubber is gonna get. And so the quality of oil that you render out from it will be a much, much inferior quality. But also, especially in tropical areas, you've just dumped a lot of blood into the water. Any guesses what that might attract? Sharks, there we go, yes, I heard it. Yes, sharks, and they are taking literal bites out of your profits. So as soon as you get back, you don't get to take a break, grab some water, maybe get something to eat, take a nap. You have to immediately start stripping the blubber off that whale, bringing it on board, and rendering the oil out of it. However, that process is much better explained on board the Morgan, where you can see the blubber room and the tri works. For right now, we're gonna wrap up this part of our demonstration and invite you to the next part of this demonstration. We're gonna put this whale boat through its paces, show you its maneuverability and its speed. So I'm gonna turn it over to Craig, our shaggy man, and we're gonna meet you around the other side of the Morgan to show off uh, what we can do with this boat. So thank you for this part. Follow me right this way.
really want to find that smooth and Carvel planking is quieter. You also get a good view of the whale line over the top of all the oar handles as uh, the people on the side with three oars are pulling and the people on, or people on the side with two oars are pushing on their oars. That in conjunction with that big long steering oar gives you an incredibly tight turning circle in this boat. So it's, it's uh, very maneuverable. And they'll, they'll take it around the other direction as well. So now the twos are pulling and the threes are sterning or pushing. And again, that steering oar just shoves that, that uh, end right around so you can spin this boat easily within its own length. Since the boat is intended to, to take people up to a whale and stick sharp things in it, one of the most important features of it is that it doesn't have a broad, flat stern, so that when you back up, that stern, the sharp stern cuts through the water. However, that's not as efficient use of the rower's body to be pushing on, on the oar rather than pulling on it. So you can see, they just don't have the throw or the, the drive, but once they get going, they get way on pretty quickly. And, uh, these kinds of maneuvers were what a green crew would be put through when they were first in a boat. You wanted the crew to have some familiarity with the handling this boat before you actually went up to a whale. Um, and the last little maneuver we'll demonstrate is the, uh, a sprint with the dead stop at the end, which is useful both for harpooning and for lancing whales. So they got her up to about top speed and then they can stop it within its own length. So um, uh, both well designed for its purposes. Um, also for its size, fairly light but very strong. Good thing that it's light because the last little bit we're going to do is take it back over to the, the ship and raise it. And there's a couple of ways you can not only watch that but help with it. Uh, one of which is involves standing around in certain places, so don't be intimidated. But if you'd like to Get, get on the lines with us and haul the boat up. That's an experience you can't have anywhere else in the world, hauling a whale boat up on a whale ship. So come and join me on the deck in the morning.